Thank you very much for the, for the uh, introduction and, and thanks for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about low calorie sweeteners and the microbiome. And the headlines really come from the uh, microbiome keeps making headlines because of its uh, people associated with so many different diseases these days. That's my uh, declarations. So I'm going to have to spend a little time introducing the gut microbiota, the factors that influence it, and talk about the evidence that it has an impact on host health, particularly its relationship to diabetes and metabolic syndrome, before I get on to looking at the effects of low-calorie sweeteners on, on the gut microbiota. So first of all, the human gut microbiota has huge numbers of bacteria in the gut. Around 4 to times 10 to 13 microbial cells associated with the, uh, the gut microbiota, and it's, we're about 50% human and 50% microbial. Um, and many of these types of bacteria have never been cultured. As well as having huge numbers, there's an enormous diversity. So there are around 1,000 different bacteria, archaea, phylotypes, microbial phylotypes. But in each individual, there's only about 150 uh, of these, of these um, organisms, or types of organisms in, in one individual. But the other important aspect is there's enormous um, inter-individual variation in, in, in uh, gut microbiota, which can have an impact on all sorts of uh, things. As well as having very diverse types of bacteria, it's got a very large uh, metabolic potential. It's considered to be equivalent in terms of metabolic activity to the liver, but then the, uh, the, the reactions are very different to that of the liver. And finally, um, it's got a very uneven distribution, which I think is very important for what we're discussing today. So, for example, there are very few um, microorganisms in the stomach because of the acidic conditions, small numbers in the small intestine in humans, and the numbers increase uh, progressively as you get further down the gut. So most of the bacteria in the gut microbiota are in the, in the colon. And this means that to have an impact on the microbiota, dietary components have to reach the colon or uh, to influence the, colon or influence the colonic environment in other ways. So if, it, if they don't get down to the colon, uh, they're not going to have, shouldn't have any effect on the human gut microbiota. Another aspect that uh, is complicating these studies is that there are lots of different ways of counting the bacteria in the gut and identifying them. So the old methods, uh, which are not really used very much anymore, were cultural methods. Um, but you can only identify about 10 to 30% of the gut bacteria in this way. Nowadays, molecular methods are used. Um, the two main ones are um, analysis of the 16S RNA um, gene present, that's present in all microorganisms, and it varies depending on the species, or metagenomic sequencing. The important thing to remember is that these different methodologies actually yield different results. So it can be difficult to compare studies, even studies within this, using the same basic methodology if the preparation of the samples is, is different. And at the moment, you know, there's no standard method for assessing the microbiota. Now, I've just put here a few of the bacteria. This is a very simplified view of the types of bacteria, but it does, some of them are ones I'm going to talk about today. So these are the main phyla, the main big groups uh, of um, bacteria in the gut. So you've got the Firmicutes and the Bacteroidetes. So 90% of the bacteria in the gut fall into these two large groups of, of Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. There are other ones as well, like Feruca microbiota. There's an, ac an important organism called Acomancia in that. And then you've got the E. coli and so on. And Actinobacteria has Bifidobacterium, which is considered to be a beneficial organism and it's used as probiotics. Within this group, there's some important ones. Clostridium is probably the main um, genus of bacteria in the gut. There are huge numbers and varieties of Clostridia in the gut. Roseburia is important, as is Fecalibacterium. I'll be talking about those in relation to the studies um, on, on diabetes. Uh, these are um, short-chain fatty acid butyrate producers. Now, a lot of different factors can have an effect on the, on the microbiota. So you've got general lifestyle, host genetics, early colonization, whether the, the, a baby was delivered vaginally or by cesarean section, and then it's whether it was breastfed or, or um, formula fed. Drugs have a big effect, particularly antibiotics can have a devastating effect on the 
bacteria in the gut. And health and disease, and I'll come on to that in a moment, can have an influence on the microbiota. Diet has a very important effect. All sorts of different studies have shown that whether a Western diet or a vegetarian diet can influence the, the composition and activity of the microbiota. Whole grain has effects. Um, fiber, fiber itself, fat protein, phytochemicals can influence the microbiota. Uh, so there are you know, a lot of potential um, effects on the, on the microbiota of diet. So what it means is if you're interested in looking at the effects of, say, low-calorie sweeteners on, on, on microbiota, it's very important to control or at very least assess the diet um, of, in, in human studies and also in, in animal studies so you don't confound it with other factors. The other thing I just want to mention is the difference between human microbiota and mouse and rat microbiota. They both have this the dominant groups of the Bacteroides and Firmicutes. But 85% of the, the genera, the types of bacteria in the mouse microbiota, are not present in humans. So they have quite different organisms dominating. Mouse, for example, has a lot of lactobacilli, and we have very few lactobacilli in our gut. And also importantly is the distribution of the microbiota is very different. Um, in mouse, the stomach and the small intestine are colonized by reasonable numbers of bacteria. As I've said um, earlier, in the human, there are no bacteria in the stomach and very little, few bacteria in the small intestine. So that limits, in, in, in animals, you can get more metabolism of compounds in the upper part of the gut. So the takeaway message from that bit is extrapolating results from mice with regard to microbiota and human health um, does have its problems, and that they're not exactly straightforward. We have to be very careful. <coughs> now, we also know that the microbiota is very important in human physiology. It has a big impact on the development and maintenance of the immune system, on digestive function, metabolism of compounds. And also now there's lots of evidence accumulating that there are associations between particular diet, particular health um, endpoints, such as particularly gastrointestinal problems, and microbiota. So there's associations with gastroenteritis, um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, um, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, cancer, um, and more recently with obesity and type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome. Now these are association studies in most cases. So you're looking at microbiota of patients versus healthy individuals. So I just want to look at look some of the, the data that's available where people have compared um, subjects or patients with type 2 diabetes and patient and healthy individuals. And there have been a number of studies. I've shown uh, four or five studies here. And all the studies show changes, so show, show differences between the two. But in general, there are no, consistent, no, no great consistencies between the studies in terms of the types of bacteria that are found. So for example, um, this study showed a decrease in, uh, in, in type 2 diabetes or lower levels of butyrate producers, such as Roseburia, and this organism, Fecalibacterium prausnitzii. There are two studies showing that. Um, this study showed an increase in proteobacteria and acomancia. Um, another study showed a decrease in acomancia um, and a decrease in Fecalibacterium. Uh, and another study showed an increase in bacteroides. Uh, decrease in firmicutes. So they're not all looking at the same organisms, but even so, there are big differences between the, uh, these studies. Gastric bypass, which, as you know, improves insulin sensitivity, uh, was showed a, a, that low levels of the pranitsii before, in, before the gastric bypass were increased after surgery. So these differences in, in outcome are probably related to the, the methodology used for identifying the bacteria, different types of subjects, the dietary control, size of subjects, and so on. We also look at um, metabolic syndrome. There's a study looking at um, comparisons of pe people with metabolic syndrome, with a range of different uh, metabolic syndrome uh, traits. And they found, this study found eight species which showed a positive association. So there were higher numbers of these organisms in the metabolic syndrome group, and they were two species of, of bacteroides were, were quite common, and then a number of species that showed a negative association with metes. So um, high levels of C. leptum, Fecalibacterium prasnitzii, and this bacteroides here, um, were uh, associated with, with low risk of, of met S. 
Now, these species changes were not really consistent with any of the changes that were seen in the type 2 diabetes studies, apart from the effects on F. prausnitzii. The big problem is that there's very little evidence about causality. So there are some studies in, in mice which suggest you might be able to transfer a, uh, a, a microbiota that's associated with type 2 diabetes from one animal to another, but very, few, uh, very little evidence in humans. This is the only one I could find. It's a small study. They had um, 18 obese male subjects. Uh, which had a microbiota that showed low diversity, so not a, a limited number of, of species. Um, they had a high bacteroides levels and low firmicute levels compared with a control group of lean individuals. Um, they gave uh, these, these, uh, these 18 people, divided them into two groups, and gave them a fecal microbial trans transplant, uh, either from their own fecal microbiota, so you've got an obese fecal microbiota, or they transferred the microbiota from a lean uh, uh, group of people. And then they measured the microbiota in those people and insulin sensitivity. And what they found was when they moved, when they transferred a lean microbiota uh, to these people, there was an increase in microbial diversity, there was an increase in butyrate producers and rosburia in particular, and at the same time, an, in an increase in insulin sensitivity, as you can see here, there's insulin sensitivity. So a bit of evidence, but I think we need more uh, the follow-up to this study to, to get some confirmation. Okay, so just to summarize that, then there are differences in microbiota composition associated with type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome, but studies are inconsistent with regard to the presence and uh, relative abundance of specific uh, microbial types. So there is some evidence, however, that low levels of Fecalibacterium prausnitzii and butyrate producers um, low levels are associated with type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome. Uh, there are one or two mouse studies that provide evidence for causal links, but we need a lot more research to establish whether the associations that have been seen in these uh, ob observational studies are causal, um, and also we need more information on the types of main organisms involved in, in humans. Okay, so moving on finally to the effects of low-calorie sweeteners on, on gut microbiota. Just a general considerations, um, these low calorie sweeteners have very diverse structures, um, as you saw from the, the slide, the, pr the previous slide. And they have different structures, they have different disposition in the body, um, so they're unlikely to have similar effects on the microbiota. Some of them, and aspartame and acelfam K are, are good examples, are completely metabolized or they're absorbed completely in the small intestine. So they don't reach the colonic microbiota, though, so therefore direct effects are <coughs> unlikely. And other, others, like sucralose, they're not absorbed, but there's a lot of evidence that they're not metabolized by bacteria in, in the colon, so they're unlikely to be energy substrates and have an effect on the, on the microbiota. And in any case, the amounts are fairly small anyway. The studies that have been done, as you'll see in a moment, often use high doses, um, and many of the studies have very poor dietary control. So I've just summarized um, all the evidence on one slide of um, the effects of different low-calorie sweeteners on gut microbiota composition and metabolism. And you can see that with every, virtually every low-calorie sweetener, I mean, people have done studies, and they're usually studies, I have to say, in mice and rats. There are not that many human studies. Um, they see changes. Um, not all of them are of great biological significance, but you can see that virtually all these, all, all these um, sweeteners, even including steviol, which is the, uh, the, sort of the latest sweetener, which, has, um, which is derived from the stevia leaf, um, all have been studied, and the change, they, all sh they all show changes. So what I'd like to do is just talk about one or two of these in a little more detail, uh, starting with saccharid, um, because it's the most widely used uh, one, and it's been around for a long time. And a lot of the early studies used rats with, at a very high dose in the diet, and see the, some of the studies that we did in my lab. And these studies showed that was increase um, when, we, when we fed high doses of sacchar saccharin, increase in sequel bacteria, but no, no change in types, although this was done by cultural counts. There was a decrease in sequel enzymes, so metabolism, and a decrease in short-chain fatty acids, particularly butyrate, in, in these studies. 
And one of these studies showed an increase in certain protein amino acid metabolites of bacteria, which are considered to be a potentially um, uh, toxic. So indicans, paracresol, and ammonia. Then a follow-up study looking at particularly on indican excretion, these protein metabolites found nothing uh, um, adverse in, in humans. So it may have been just the high dose that was given to the rats. And then there are a number of more recent studies. So this is a study in, in mice giving low dose of um, saccharin in the drinking water for actually for six months. Uh, and this group was particularly interested in inflammatory changes and they found a, an increase in TNF-alpha gene expression in the liver. They found an increase um, in these animals in six genera of bacteria, including Acomancia. They saw an increase in Roseburia and this Turicibacter, which is only found in, in, in mice and rats anyway. Um, and a decrease in Ruminococcus and a group called Dorea. This is shown, notice there's an increase in Roseburia, which um, from the, uh, the type 2 diabetes studies suggests that actually Roseburia is associated with protection against um, uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, this is the study, the Suez study, which was probably generated the, the great deal of interest in the fact that low calorie sweeteners might adversely affect the microbiota and, and consequently have an effect on type 2 di diabetes. And this Suez study was quite a, a large one uh, and complicated one. They did some studies in, in mice, first of all, giving saccharin very high doses, 3,000 mg per kg per day, very high dose for 11 weeks. And they saw some changes, some increased in bacteroides, um, decreases in Clostridia uh, and Lactobacillus, a decrease in Acomancia. And this also said they saw an increase in fecal short-chain fatty acids. Um, we've just heard that propionate may be important in, in um, having beneficial effects on, on, on glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity, but they saw an increase in this case but these, these values here are very odd. I don't know where they get that fact that the, back, the, one of the, the control group had no acetate in it at all. But the problem with this was that the food consumption was very different between the groups. That was a 50% lower in the, in the saccharin group. So how that, you, it's very difficult to conclude that the LCS was responsible. They did two types of human study, had an observational study uh, with high and low consumers of LCS. They didn't specify saccharin or anything else. It was just whether you consumed any low-calorie sweetener. Um, and they found that actinobacteria, enterobacteria AC was, were linked to LCS, but there was no dietary assessment in these, in these people. So again, in, in 172 people, you're gonna get a lot of different dietary intakes, so I'm not sure how that, what that tells us. And then they did a small study just in seven subjects, giving them saccharin for five days. Um, four out of the seven people showed poorer glycemic response, and they also showed changes in microbiota. So they saw an increase in bacteroides, a decrease in clostridia, and an increase in, in lactobacilli. Interesting, the changes were different to those seen in this observational study. And in this particular study, there was no untreated control group, and there was no dietary control. So again, difficult to conclude very much from that. Sucralose, uh, been quite a few studies on sucralose, um, mostly in rats and mice. Uh, this is a study looking at um, Splendor, which is the commercial sort of sucralose. So sucralose is in quite low concentration in Splendor. The rest of it is a, a maltodextrin. Uh, they saw small decreases in total bacteria, basically, um, and a few lact changes in lactobacilli and bacteroides. But these were very small. These were less than one log difference, which is not really very great, um, a, a very great change in bacterial terms. Uh, this is a mice giving uh, five mg per kg for six months. They saw a decrease in streptococcus, a uh, decrease in staphylococcus, uh, which are potential pathogens, increased acomancia, and increase in roseburia. So I'd have thought that would, almost you could consider that potentially beneficial, certainly not adverse in terms of um, uh, type 2 diabetes risk. Um, they also saw some changes in fecal met metabolites. This one, given sucralose up to 50 mg per kg per day, they short, so no, no major changes, but sort of increase in butyrate and cholic acid, so again, possible beneficial effects. And, and a final one, mice given sucralose, again, at, at sort of 1.5 to 3 mg per kg per day, increase in firmicutes, decrease in bacteroides, increase in bifidobacterium, um, 
Overall, for sucralose, the changes were very small and inconsistent, and uh, the biological significance, I think, is questionable. Aspartame, there's been a lot of research on aspartame. Uh, this is a study looking at obese rats that were fed a high-fat diet with or without aspartame in the drinking water for eight weeks. And the aspartame treatment increased Clostridium leptum, increased rosburia, and again, you know, is that... I wouldn't have thought that was a, an adverse effect. Uh, increased enterobacteria, decreased bifidobacteria. And there was an increase also in serum propionate. Um, as we've just heard, serum propionate may well be um, an, a, an important factor in protecting against um, type 2 diabetes. There was a decreased weight gain and increase in fasting glucose. But there were big differences in other factors. So the food intake was 25% lower, the body weight was 17% lower, and there's a 40% decrease in water intake. So again, the outcomes are confounded by lack of control of other factors. And there's a human cross-sectional study of aspartame consumers. They found really no differences in bacterial abundance and small changes in diversity in only seven people. And finally, um, aspartame, uh, no, acelfame K, um, these mice given acelfame K saw an inc This particular study showed a real mishmash of results. Uh, they had male and female mice, and in some cases there was an increase in male mice, there was a decrease in lactobacillus and clostridium only in the females, there was an increase in fecal metabolites only in the males, and a decrease in females, weight gain only in males. So really, um, a bit of a mess, that study. Um, and then a, a study looking at um, 15 mg per day for eight weeks, no effects on microbiota or fecal metabolites, no effect on, on weight. And a human cross-sectional study, again, just in these, this small uh, group of seven people, no differences in microbial abundance or, or microbial genes. <coughs> so, uh, to finish, um, the uh, key takeaways are, there are differences in human microbiota associated with health, especially gastrointestinal disorders, but evidence uh, for causal links with metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes are somewhat limited. <laughs> the bacterial types and metabolites and mechanisms involved where we do see differences in, in, um, between type 2 diabetic patients and controls are not fully elucidated. We need more information on that. Most studies of low-calorie sweeteners on microbiota are in mice and rats, but the effects in general are small, and they're confounded by inadequate control groups and no dietary control. There are a few studies on um, LCS and microbiota in humans, but the effects are inconsistent and, again, difficult to interpret due to lack of dietary control or any, any control groups in some studies. And the changes seen were not consistent with those reported in type 2 diabetes patients or MET-S patients, apart from some, studies, some effects on um, the Caelobacterium and Roseburia. So really, we need well-controlled human studies to explore further this interaction of low-calorie sweeteners and microbiota in relation to, to glucose tolerance, insulin sensitivity, uh, metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes. So I, my overall conclusion is that the current evidence does not support the fact that LCS have adverse effects on health via an impact on, on gut microbiota. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>